Hi friends, welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for day 20 of our read along together of Emma by Jane Austen. We are starting the very last week of our read along together. And before we get into a bunch of housekeeping, I am going to start my tea. I didn't brew it in advance this time because it's one of those blooming teas that I've had before. They were not labeled. So based on the picture and how it looks, I think this is the Lavender Dream. So we're just gonna go ahead and let it steep. And just cause I think it's kind of fun to watch it bloom, um, thought we'd go ahead and do this part together. Actually, maybe I can try until it gets hot or my arm gets weak <laughs> to hold it up. Hello, good to see you. I'll try to hold it up until um, it's time for, uh, until it's time, until it's time. Well, let's hold it for a little while and see if you guys can see. Oh, it's hard to tell it's hiding in the back there. Come on, little bloom. All right, well, I'll just hold it up and we'll continue our conversation. So what I was gonna let you guys know about was we have a few different activities coming up. Um, as I email or messaged about last week, um, we do have our, th this book, our read along will conclude, hello, on Thursday, the 11th. And so on Saturday, the 13th is when we have our film screening schedule. And so the film screening is not what I originally intended, which was that we'd all watch it together at the exact same time. You can watch it anytime between 3 p.m. and midnight on Saturday the 13th. You do, however, need to register on our events calendar for the San Diego Public Library. It's free, but that way you can get like the login for which site you go to. And then on Friday morning, you'll get an email telling you exactly what's the passcode so you can get into that site to watch the film. So that should be really fun. Um, let's see, what else? Mm -mm. Oh, if you do kind of want to watch it together, at 2.45, I, I know it's like watching the grass grow, but watching the tea bloom, somehow that appeals to me. Okay, I don't know if you can see, it's starting to kind of, se oh, sorry, it's starting to separate out a little bit, but we'll see if it keeps blooming. Actually, let me hold this up from the other angle. Okay, so um, I'll still get this up there so you guys can see. So um, let's see what else. Where was I? Oh yeah, I'm 2.45 on Saturday. I'm going to live stream sort of like this. Um, just a little thing showing off my tea stuff, what I've got set up. If you have tea stuff set up, I would love to see what you have set up for the film. Um, we could talk a little bit about what we think is gonna happen. And then right at three o'clock, even though we can't live stream it together, I'm going to start watching it right at three o'clock and I'm gonna be commenting in that same thread with my comments as I go along. So if anyone else wants to watch it at the same time and share your comments, that would be really fun. Or if you end up watching it later on and you also feel like sharing your comments or reading along to see what other people say and chiming in later on, that would be really neat. I mean, I just think we've had such a good experience reading the book together. I think it adds a lot to the experience because we could all read these things alone at home, but it's reading it together that just adds a little extra something special where we get to talk about it and think about it together and maybe consider different things that we wouldn't have otherwise. And so if you guys would like to watch the film together, I would really enjoy doing that. And so I'm gonna be watching it at three o'clock and writing comments in that thread. Also on the Monday afterwards, on the 15th, we'll have our usual Zoom tea party. And we'll be talking about not just the book, but also the film. So if you would like to join us for that, you can RSVP on the, um, um, for the uh, Facebook event. And it's the same, is it the same login information? No, it's different login information, but when you sign up for the film, you'll also get the login information for the Monday Zoom. So that'll be fun. Let's see, now what else? The other housekeeping I wanted to bring up to you, and by the way, this needs to steep for hmm, three to four minutes. Let's see how am I doing time? Okay, another minute or so. It doesn't look, oh, so you can see it's opening up a bit now. Here we go, can you see that? It's starting to spread out. Oh, I'm so excited. All right, so um, I'll keep holding it up while it blooms. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, the other thing I was gonna mention to you is the housekeeping about our what book we'll read next. Right now, we are, as I said, we have just four more days of reading along with Emma. And so next week on Monday, we're going to be having our tea party. So on Tuesday, the 16th, what should we read? Um, we're only gonna vote through this Tuesday because I need time to order the book. And so right now there are eight different titles in the running. There's still time to add something if you really wanna pick a different book. Um, but right now what's leading with four votes is Roughing It by Mark Twain. But close behind it with three votes each is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, and Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Also, I wouldn't rule out the books that have two votes going for them. Right now, the, book, the books that have two votes are Little Women by Louisa May Alcott and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne and a late entry, I just added it the other day after I read a good review, um, Moby Dick by Herman Melville. So really good books available there for us to choose from. I hope that you'll find something there that you would like, you would like to read. 
And if you have not yet voted, please, please, please go in today within the next 24 hours to vote because we're going to announce our winner tomorrow afternoon at three. And if there is a tie for the lead, then we'll do the drawing. But otherwise, now we're just gonna go by whatever has the most votes if there is an actual winner on votes. So, oh, look at that tea, it's blooming. It reminds me of a sea anemone. It's just all like spreading out like that. How are we on time? 3.06. I'm gonna give it just a little bit longer because I'm not sure that it's totally a vibrant color that I was hoping for. But let's see, um, is there anything else? No, oh, no, I think it is time to pour out. Well, we'll find out what this is. I thought, based on how that little tea sachet nubbin thing looked, ooh, ow, 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 sorry. I moved my finger and I accidentally touched my finger against the hot part of the pot. <laughs> that was not good. Um, let's see, I thought this was Lavender Dream, which it describes as, uh-oh, I briefly disconnected. Can somebody let me know if you can still see? I'm gonna keep talking, let's hope it works again. So I thought this was Lavender Dream, which was white tea buds unfurled to reveal majestic red hibiscus petals as crisp aromatic lavender flowers are released into a crimson tea. I thought that was it, but this doesn't look very crimson, although you can see something red in the middle there. Instead, this might be the Dragon Lily, which is what I thought I had last time. It says the Dragon Lily is an arrangement of white tea sewn around an orange lily and sprinkles of osmanthus flowers has velvety apricot flavor. This looks a bit more like that, but isn't that gorgeous? Hello, Helen, thank you for letting me know this is still working, I really appreciate it. But isn't that beautiful with that orangey red flower in there? Oh, stunning, okay. Time to pour out and see what we have. I think it probably is the Dragon Lily rather than the Lavender Dream. Mmm, slowest pour in the world. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, Bill. I'm having the tea with the, um, sorry. Bill's a coworker. He, he's the one who gave me these teas a few months back, and I'm finally getting to the last ones. This one, I thought, ah! That was exciting. This is why I should use two hands instead of holding it up to see. It's okay, there was no breakage of glass and no major spilling of tea. Sorry about that, but yeah, everything is working. Sorry. I'm gonna pour it down below now. <laughs> but I think this is the Dragon Lily rather than the Lavender Dream. That was dramatic, huh? Okay. <laughs> but isn't that beautiful, like how you can see how it opened up from that little tiny gray thing that it was hard to even tell which tea it was, and then we got to see it open up and just unfurl itself. Really beautiful. Okay. Let's go ahead and start talking about what happened on Thursday in our book because it was amazing. There were really exciting things that happened. Sorry, I'm sort of mopping up a little bit of water on my desk also. All right, let's see. As tidy as it's gonna get, let's go. Um, so on Thursday, we had a really momentous day. <sighs> Previously, there had been the scandal at Box Hill where they had the um, the luncheon party, or yeah, the the, vo the trip outside, and basically people were out of sorts, and both Emma and Frank Churchill, yes. <laughs> Sometimes it's possible to be a little too involved in the tea, but that said, mm, smells good. Yeah, this is definitely not the, the lavender tea. This, is ha this has to be the dragon lily with the apricot flavor. Really nice. Okay, so, um, yeah, so they had gone to Box Hill and Emma and Frank Churchill and everyone was just sort of like off kilter. They were, things weren't going right and it was, it was really uncomfortable. And Emma had actually, you know, gone so far as to say something inappropriate. Not like, I mean, it was just, it was rather un, uncharacteristically cruel. Um, or, yeah, to Miss Bates. And it was something that later on Mr. Knightley called her on and she felt really terrible about it, but it was too late. And so um, where we had ended the previous day was with Emma weeping um, as she drove away in her carriage with Harriet beside her, both of them silent and just thinking about the day. So what we read together on Thursday was the aftermath of Box Hill's journey. Emma decides that she needs to pay her penance to Miss Bates. And so she doesn't directly address it, but she goes to Miss Bates's residence. And um, when she gets there, Miss Bates and Jane Fairfax both sort of like go away. And she sort of hears them saying like, oh, you know, they need to like tell her that I'm, I'm going to bed. And so Emma's like, what's going on up there? It seems like they're avoiding Emma. But Miss Bates does come down and at first, she's a little more stilted in her conversation, but Emma encourages her to speak more by asking about the welfare of Jane Fairfax, which again, opens the floodgates and Miss Bates goes back to normal. She realizes again that Emma cares about her and wants to talk with her. And so 
that sort of mends that little problem, which is nice. Um, and Emma genuinely seems to have realized that what she did was unkind and that she cares about these people and she wants to show them better. And so she is determined to be a better neighbor to them, um, to these people who she does genuinely see as friends. And so um, she goes out there and she's talking to Miss Bates about what's wrong with Jane Fairfax, who seems to be perturbed about something. And the story is that Jane Fairfax has been... Um, Mrs. Elton had been trying to help Jane Fairfax find a position as a governess. Jane Fairfax had been putting her off saying, no, no, please don't do that. But then now she's changed her mind. She said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And Miss Elton found her a position. And Jane Fairfax, even though she said it was what she wanted, is really upset about it. She doesn't really want to go. She's up, she's sad. She's, you know, and so she's, she's distraught. And so um, it also comes out in this chapter that Emma Woodhouse is the only person that is really being refused entry to speak to Jane Fairfax. That even though she is bothered and she might want to be alone, she's allowing in Mrs. Cole, she's allowing in Mrs. Elton, she's allowing in the various neighbors, but not Emma Woodhouse. So Emma Woodhouse is being singled out um, by being excluded in this way. Um, then, um, Emma goes home after calling on the Bateses, and when she does, she sees Mr. Knightley waiting for her there, and she would like to speak with him and let him know how sorry she is about what had happened the other time at Box Hill, but there's not an opportunity because he says he's about to go to London. He just stayed long enough to bid her goodbye, and um, that's it. And before she can say anything to him, um, Emma's father says something along the lines of, oh, my dear, wonderful Emma, you're always so kind to, the, to Miss Bates. I know you were just calling on them. How was it? And he sa she he then says Emma's always so attentive to them and Emma is stricken to the core she's ashamed about her bad behavior the last time she saw Miss Bates and so she feels that it's not just for her to be praised in this way by her father and Mr. Knightley can see it on her face that she really was sorry about what had happened and that she was trying to do better and so Mr. Um, Knightley's good opinion of her seems to be restored even though they don't get a chance to talk with each other she can see that he seems um, happier with her. Um, there's actually an awkward little moment where he sort of reaches for her hand and she thinks he's about to kiss her hand in a gentlemanly gesture but then he does not and so she's like well wait is there something still going on weird between us what's happening why won't he you know why wouldn't he follow through that gesture but it, but he, he, does, he seems to no longer be upset with her. Then the big news that happens in that chapter, there's so much big news as we get near the end of the book, is that Mrs. Churchill, the aunt of Frank Churchill, who has sort of been like an adoptive mother to him, um, has passed away. And so it's like, wow, we all thought she was a hypochondriac and just making it up. But no, she really, or just trying to get attention. But she really must have been sick because here she is dead. And so that's Mr. Woodhouse's reflection, or Mr. Weston's reflection, which is amusing. Um, let's see. J or, um, Emma, meanwhile, is still trying to help Jane Fairfax. She really feels bad about what happened. And so she was trying to like, she can see Jane Fairfax was upset um, from the last time when she called and wouldn't even come down. And she's heard reports from the doc from Dr. Perry and others that Jane Fairfax is still very distraught. And she tries to invite her out to go on a carriage ride. She tries to offer different things for her. And, and Jane Fairfax just keeps refusing her over and over again. Um, and then finally, the last chapter that we read, which was chapter 10 of volume three or chapter 46 of the book, big things happened. So in that chapter, um, Mr. Weston comes to visit and he says, I have to speak with you. And or, or more specifically, my wife has to speak with you. She's going to break the news to you. And she's like, break the news to me. What's wrong? What's happened? Is something wrong with Mrs. Weston? Is something wrong with my family? Is something wrong with Mr. Knightley or John Knightley or my sister or the little Knightley's like, what's going on? And he's like, I perhaps said that a little not well. Come on over, talk to my wife. She has something to tell you. And so they get over to Randall's and Mrs. Weston reveals that da, 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 there was a letter or Frank Weston had stopped by sorry Frank Churchill had stopped by and he had told his parents that um his father and his stepmother that um he has been engaged the in since the fall previous um to Jane Fairfax that when they had met each other in Weymouth they had um become secretly affianced and that they had decided to keep the engagement a secret and so Emma has to convince Mrs. Weston, which she can do with a clean conscience because it's true that she is not heartbroken, that Mr. that even though Frank Churchill was flirting with her along the way, and basically we find out he was flirting with her to um, take attention away from his actual feelings for Jane Fairfax. Um, 
but they want to make sure that her feelings were not hurt by this, that she didn't genuinely fall in love with him herself, thinking that the flirtation was real. And Emma says, you know, truthfully, there was a little time where I thought maybe, she's like, but I don't love him. I realized I don't love him. I am not bothered by this. And you are so lucky to have Jane Fairfax for her future daughter-in-law. And so she is able to convince them of the truth of that. And also um, by the end of the chapter, Mr. Weston is again, already thrilled about, he's a very cheerful man, thrilled about having Jane Fairfax in the family. And it ends by th saying he had become so perfectly reconciled that he was not far from thinking it was the very best thing that Frank could possibly have done. So the only thing I'm gonna add in this, because it's time to get into our story, um, is that now that you know the secret of Frank Churchill having been engaged to Jane Fairfax the entire time, if you can, if this is your first time reading it, I encourage you to go back to some of those earlier scenes. Um, it's it's really nicely done how how I mean it, once you know the secret it's really it's really obvious and everything but it's like he tries so hard to misdirect everyone from realizing his feelings for Jane Fairfax and so it's like he'll often visit Hartfield and say well I'll just happen to stop over there or yeah I'll just happen to go visit the bases or like how he happened to tell his mother or you know his stepmother that she had said she would go visit the piano forte right after it was delivered she's like I don't remember saying I'd do that but my but Frank says I did Frank was manufacturing excuses after excuses to go visit with Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax. Um, there's also, um, there's several instances too where like they would say like, eh, maybe somebody has to go there to visit the Bateses. He's like, well, I don't really want to do it, but if you think I need to. And so he just, he was frequently in contact at the Bates house, uh, at the Bates and Fairfax residence without trying to draw attention to himself. So it's just, if you get a chance, go back and look over some of those chapters again. It's really hilarious to see how openly he was courting her and visiting her while hiding it under this um, pretense of just being sort of forced to by manners to have to go visit when really he was going to visit the woman that he was engaged to. All right, so let's go ahead and read together today two chapters, chapters 47 and 48 of the book or chapters 11 and 12 of volume three. As I said, this is our last week of reading together in Emma. So a lot more threads are going to come together. Let's see how this book ends. We now know that Emma's not gonna end up with Frank Churchill. Let's see, does she end up single or is there somebody else out there for her? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Hmm. All right, let's go in chapter 11 of volume three or chapter 47 of the book. Harriet, poor Harriet. Those were the words. In them lay the tormenting ideas which Emma could not get rid of and which constituted the real misery of the business to her. Frank Churchill had behaved very ill by herself, very ill in many ways, but it was not so much his behavior as her own which made her so angry with him. It was the scrape which he had drawn her into on Harriet's account that gave the deepest hue to his offense. Poor Harriet, to be a second time the dupe of her misconceptions and flattering. Mr. Knightley had spoken prophetically when he once said, Emma, you have been no friend to Harriet Smith. She was afraid she had done her nothing but disservice. It was true that she had not to charge herself, in this instance as in the former, with being the sole and original author of the mischief, with having suggested such feelings as might otherwise never have entered Harriet's imagination, for Harriet had acknowledged her admiration and preference of Frank Churchill before she had ever given her a hint on the subject, but she felt completely guilty of having encouraged what she might have repressed. She might have prevented the indulgence and increase of such sentiments. Her influence would have been enough, and now she was very conscious that she ought to have prevented them. She felt that she had been risking her friend's happiness on most insufficient grounds. Common sense would have directed her to tell Harriet that she must not allow herself to think of him and that there were 500 chances to one against his ever caring for her. But with common sense, she added, I am afraid I have had little to do. She was extremely angry with herself. If she could not have been angry with Frank Churchill too, it would have been dreadful. <laughs> As for Jane Fairfax, she might at least relieve her feelings from any present solicitude on her account. Harriet would be anxiety enough. She need no longer be unhappy about Jane, whose troubles and whose ill health having, of course, the same origin, must be equally under cure. Her days of insignificance and evil were over. She would soon be well and happy and, pro and prosperous. Emma could now imagine why her own attentions had been slighted. This discovery laid many smaller matters open. 
No doubt it had been from jealousy. In Jane's eyes, she had been a rival, and well might anything she could offer of assistance or regard be repulsed. An airing in the Hartfield carriage would have been the rack. An arrow root from the Hartfield storeroom must have been poison. She understood it all, and as far as her mind could disengage itself from the injustice and selfishness of angry feelings, she acknowledged that Jane Fairfax would have neither elevation nor happiness beyond her desert. But poor Harriet was such an engrossing charge. There was little sympathy to be spared for anybody, yel for anybody else. Emma was sadly fearful that this second disappointment would be more severe than the first, considering the very superior claims of the object it ought, and judging by its apparently stronger effect on Harriet's mind, producing reserve and self-command, it would. She must communicate the painful truth, however, and as soon as possible. An injunction of secrecy had been among Mr. Weston's parting words. For the present, the whole affair was to be completely a secret. Mr. Churchill had made a point of it as a token of respect to the wife he had so very recently lost, and everybody admitted it to be no more than due decorum. Emma had promised, but still, Harriet must be accepted. It was her superior duty. In spite of her vexation, she could not help feeling it almost ridiculous that she should have the very same distressing and delicate office to perform by Harriet, which Mrs. Weston had just gone through by herself. The intelligence which had been so anxiously announced to her, she was now to be anxiously announcing to another. Her heart beat quick on hearing Harriet's footstep and voice. So she, so she supposed, had poor Mrs. Weston felt when she was approaching Randall's. Could the event of the disclosure bear an equal resemblance? But of that, unfortunately, there could be no chance. Well, Miss Woodhouse, cried Harriet, coming eagerly into the room, is not this the oddest news that ever was? What news do you mean? replied Emma, unable to guess by look or voice whether Harriet could indeed have received any hint. About Jane Fairfax. Did you ever hear anything so strange? Oh, you need not be afraid of owning it to me, for Mr. Weston has told me himself. I met him just now. He told me it was to be a great secret, and therefore I should not think of mentioning it to anybody but you. But he said you knew it. What did Mr. Weston tell you? said Emma, still perplexed. Oh, he told me all about it, that Jane Fairfax and Mr. Frank Churchill are to be married, and that they have been privately engaged to one another this long while. How very odd. It was indeed so odd. Harriet's behavior was so extremely odd that Emma did not know how to understand it. Her character appeared absolutely changed. She seemed to propose showing no agitation or disappointment or peculiar concern in the discovery. Emma looked at her, quite unable to speak. Had you any idea, cried Harriet, of his being in love with her? You perhaps might. You, blushing as she spoke, who can see into everybody's heart, but nobody else. Upon my word, said Emma, I begin to doubt my having any such talent. Can you seriously ask me, Harriet, whether I imagined him attached to another woman at the very time that I was, tacitly if not openly, encouraging you to give way to your own feelings? I never had the slightest suspicion till within the last hour of Mr. Frank Churchill's having the least regard for Jane Fairfax. You may be very sure that if I had, I should have cautioned you accordingly. Me, cried Harriet, coloring and astonished. Why should you caution me? You do not think I care about Mr. Frank Churchill. I am delighted to hear you speak so stoutly on the subject, replied Emma, smiling. But you do not mean to deny that there was a time, and not very distant either, when you gave me reason to understand that you did care about him. Him? Never, never. Dear Miss Woodhouse, how could you so mistake me? Turning away, distressed. Harriet, cried Emma after a moment's pause. What do you mean? Good heaven, what do you mean? Mistake you? Am I to suppose then? She could not speak another word. Her voice was lost and she sat down, waiting in great terror till Harriet should answer. 
Harriet, who was standing at some distance and with, and with face turned from her, did not immediately say anything. And when she did speak, it was in a voice nearly as agitated as Emma's. I should not have thought it possible, she began, that you could have misunderstood me. I know we agreed never to name him, but considering how infinitely superior he is to everybody else, I should not have thought it possible that I could be supposed to mean any other person. Mr. Frank Churchill, indeed. I do not know who would ever look at him in the company of the other. I hope I have a better taste than to think of Mr. Frank Churchill, who is like nobody by his side. And that you should have been so mistaken is amazing. I am sure, but for believing that you entirely approved and meant to encourage me in my attachment, I should have considered it at first too great a presumption almost to dare to think of him. At first, if you had not told me that more wonderful things had happened, that there had been matches of greater disparity, those were your very words, I should not have dared to give way to, I should not have thought it possible. But if you, who had been always acquainted with him, Harriet, cried Emma, collecting herself resolutely, let us understand each other now without the possibility of farther mistake. Are you speaking of Mr. Knightley? To be sure I am. I never could have an idea of anybody else. And so I thought you knew. When we talked about him, it was clear as possible. Not quite, returned Emma with forced calmness. For all that you said then appeared to me to relate to a different person. I could almost assert that you had named Mr. Frank Churchill. I am sure the service Mr. Frank Churchill had rendered you in protecting you from the gypsies was spoken of. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, how you do forget. My dear Harriet, I perfectly remember the substance of what I said on the occasion. I told you that I did not wonder at your attachment that considering the service he had rendered you, it was extremely natural, and you agreed to it, expressing yourself very warmly as to your sense of that service, and mentioning even what your sensations had been in seeing him come forward to your rescue. The impression of it is strong on my memory. Oh dear, cried Harriet, now I recollect what you mean, but I was thinking of something very different at the time. It was not the gypsies, it was not Mr. Frank Churchill that I meant. No, with some elevation. I was thinking of a much more precious circumstance, of Mr. Knightley's coming and asking me to dance when Mr. Elton would not stand up with me, and when there was no other partner in the room. That was the kind action. That was the noble benevolence and generosity. That was the service which made me begin to feel how superior he was to every other being upon earth. Good God, cried Emma, this has been a most unfortunate, most deplorable mistake. What is to be done? You would not have encouraged me then if you had understood me. At least, however, I cannot be worse off than I should have been if the other had been the person. And now it is possible. She paused a few moments. Emma could not speak. I do not wonder, Miss Woodhouse, she resumed, that you should feel a great difference between the two, as to me or as to anybody. You must think one five hundred million times more above me than the other. But I hope, Miss Woodhouse, that supposing, that if, strange as it may appear, but you know they were your own words, that more wonderful things have happened, Matches of greater disparity had taken place than between Mr. Frank Churchill and me, and therefore it seems as if such a thing, even as this, may have occurred before. And if I should be so fortunate, beyond expression as to, if Mr. Knightley should really, if he does not mind the disparity, I hope, dear Miss Woodhouse, you will not set yourself against it and try to put difficulties in the way but you are too good for that, I am sure. Harriet was standing at one of the windows. Emma turned round to look at her in consternation and hastily said, have you any idea of Mr. Knightley's returning your affection? Yes, said Harriet modestly, but not fearfully. I must say that I have. Emma's eyes were instantly withdrawn, and she sat silently meditating in a fixed attitude for a few minutes. 
A few minutes were sufficient for making her acquainted with her own heart. A mind like hers, once opening to suspicion, made rapid progress. She touched, she admitted, she acknowledged the whole truth. Why was it so much worse that Harriet should be in love with Mr. Knightley than with Frank Churchill? Why was the evil so dreadfully increased by Harriet's having some hope of a return? It darted through her with the speed of an arrow that Mr. Knightley must marry no one but herself. Her own conduct as well as her own heart was before her in the same few minutes. She saw it all with a clearness which had never blessed her before. How improperly had she been acting by Harriet? How inconsiderate, how indelicate, how irrational, how unfeeling had been her conduct? What blindness, what madness had led her on? It struck her with dreadful force and she was ready to give it every bad name in the world. Some portion of respect for herself, however, in spite of all these demerits, some concern for her own appearance and a strong sense of justice by Harriet. There would be no need of compassion to the girl who believed herself loved by Mr. Knightley, but justice required that she should not be made unhappy by any coldness now. Gave Emma the resolution to sit and endure farther with calmness, with even apparent kindness. For her own advantage indeed, it was fit that the utmost extent of Harriet's hopes should be inquired into, and Harriet had done nothing to forfeit the regard and interest which had been so voluntarily formed and maintained, or to deserve to be slighted by the person whose counsels had never led her right. Rousing from reflection, therefore, and subduing her emotion, she turned to Harriet again, and, in a more inviting accent, renewed the conversation. For as to the subject which had first introduced it, the wonderful story of Jane Fairfax, that was quite sunk and lost. Neither of them thought but of Mr. Knightley and themselves. Harriet, who had been standing in no unhappy reverie, was yet very glad to be called from it by the now encouraging manner of such a judge and such a friend as Miss Woodhouse, and only wanted invitation to give the history of her hopes with great, though trembling, delight. Emma's tremblings as she asked and as she listened were better concealed than Harriet's, but they were not less. Her voice was not unsteady, but her mind was in awe the perturbation that such a development of self, such a burst of threatening evil, such a confusion of sudden and perplexing emotions must create. She listened with much inward suffering, but with great outward patience to Harriet's detail. Methodical or well-arranged or very well-delivered, it could not be expected to be, but it contained, when separated from all the feebleness and tautology of the narration, a substance to sink her spirit, especially with the corroborating circumstances which her own memory brought in favor of Mr. Knightley's most improved opinion of Harriet. Harriet had been conscious of a difference in his behavior ever since those two decisive dances. Emma knew that he had, on that occasion, found her much superior to his expectation. From that evening, or at least from the time of Miss Woodhouse's encouraging him to th her to think of him, Harriet had begun to be sensible of his talking to her much more than he, had than he had been used to do, and of his having indeed quite a different manner towards her, a manner of kindness and sweetness. Latterly, she had been more and more aware of it. When they had been all walking together, he had so often come and walked by her and talked so very delightfully. He seemed to want to be acquainted with her. Emma knew it to have been very much the case. She had often observed the change to almost the same extent. Harriet repeated expressions of approbation and praise from him, and Emma felt them to be in the closest agreement with what she had known of his opinion of Harriet. He praised her for being without art or affectation, for having simple, honest, generous feelings. She knew that he saw such recommendations in Harriet. He had dwelt on them to her more than once. Much that lived in Harriet's memory, many little particulars of the notice she had received from him, a look, a speech, a removal from one chair to another, a compliment implied, a preference inferred, had been unnoticed because unsuspected by Emma. Circumstances that might swell to half an hour's relation and contained multiplied proofs to her who had seen them had passed undiscerned by her who now heard them. But the two latest occurrences to be mentioned, the two of strongest promise to Harriet, were not without some degree of witness from Emma herself. The first was his walking with her apart from the others in the lime walk at Donwell, where they had been walking some time before Emma came, and he had taken pains, as she was convinced, to draw her from the rest to himself. And at first he had talked to her in a most particular way, 
excuse me, talk to her in a more particular way than he had ever done before, in a very particular way indeed. Harriet could not recall it without a blush. He seemed to be almost asking her whether her affections were engaged, but as soon as she, Miss Woodhouse, appeared likely to join them, he changed the subject and began talking about farming. The second was his having sat talking with her nearly half an hour before Emma came back from her visit, the very last morning of his being at Hartfield, though when he first came in, he had said that he could not stay five minutes, and his having told her during their conversation that though he must go to London, it was very much against his inclination that he left home at all, which was much more, as Emma felt, than he had acknowledged to her. The superior degree of confidence towards Harriet, which this one article marked, gave her severe pain. On the subject of the first of the two circumstances, she did, after a little reflection, venture the following question. Might he not? Is not it possible that when inquiring, as you thought, into the state of your affections, he might be alluding to Mr. Martin? He might have Mr. Martin's interest in view. But Harriet rejected the suspicion with spirit. Mr. Martin, no indeed. There was not a hint of Mr. Martin. I hope I know better now than to care for Mr. Martin or to be suspected of it. When Harriet had closed her evidence, she appealed to her dear Miss Woodhouse to say whether she had not good ground for hope. I never should have presumed to think of it at first, said she, but for you, you told me to observe him carefully and let his behavior be the rule of mine. And so I have, but now I seem to feel that I may deserve him and that if he does choose me, it will not be anything so very wonderful. The bitter feelings occasioned by this speech, the many bitter feelings made the utmost exertion necessary on Emma's side to enable her to say in reply, Harriet, I will only venture to declare that Mr. Knightley is the last man in the world who would intentionally give any woman the idea of his feeling for her more than he really does. Harriet seemed ready to worship her friend for a sentence so satisfactory and Emma was only saved from raptures and fondness, which at that moment would have been dreadful penance by the sound of her father's footsteps. He was coming through the hall. Harriet was too much agitated to encounter him. She could not, she could not compose herself. Mr. Woodhouse would be alarmed. She had better go. With most ready encouragement from her friend, therefore, she passed off through another door, and the moment she was gone, this was the spontaneous burst of Emma's feelings. Oh, God, that I had never seen her. The rest of the day, the following night, were hardly enough for her thoughts. She was bewildered amidst the confusion of all that had rushed on her within the last few hours. Every moment had brought a fresh surprise, and every surprise must be matter of humiliation to her. How to understand it all? How to understand the deceptions she had been thus practicing on herself and living under? the blunders, the blindness of her own head and heart. She sat still, she walked about, she tried her own room, she tried the shrubbery. In every place, every posture, she perceived that she had acted most weakly, that she had been imposed on by others in a most mortifying degree, that she had been imposing on herself in a degree yet more mortifying, that she was wretched and should probably find this day but the beginning of wretchedness. To understand thoroughly understand her own heart was the first endeavor. To that point went every leisure moment which her father's claims on her allowed and every moment of involuntary absence of mind. How long had Mr. Knightley been so dear to her as every feeling declared him now to be? When had his influence, such influence begun? When had he succeeded to that place in her affection which Frank Churchill had once for a short period occupied? She looked back, she compared the two, compared them as they had always stood in her estimation from the time of the latter's becoming known to her, and as they must at any time have been compared by her, had it, oh, had it by any blessed felicity occurred to her to institute the comparison. She saw that there never had been a time when she did not consider Mr. Knightley as infinitely the superior, or when his regard for her had not been infinitely the most dear. She saw that, in persuading herself, in fancying, in acting to the contrary, she had been entirely under a delusion, totally ignorant of her own heart, and, in short, that she had never really cared for Frank Churchill at all. This was the conclusion of the first series of reflection. 
This was the knowledge of herself on the first question of inquiry, which she reached, and without being long in reaching it, she was most sorrowfully indignant, ashamed of every sensation but the one revealed to her, her affection for Mr. Knightley. Every other part of her mind was disgusting. With, with insufferable vanity had she believed herself in the secret of everybody's feelings, with unpardonable arrogance proposed to arrange everybody's destiny. She was proved to have been universally mistaken, and she had not quite done nothing, for she had done mischief. She had brought evil on Harriet, on herself, and she too much feared on Mr. Knightley. Were this most unequal of connections to take place, on her must rest all the reproach of having given it a beginning. For his attachment, she must believe to be produced only by a consciousness of Harriet's. And even were this not the case, the case, he would never have known Harriet at all, but for her folly. Mr. Knightley and Harriet Smith. It was a union to distance every wonder of the kind. The attachment of Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax became commonplace, threadbare, stale in the comparison, exciting no surprise, presenting no disparity, affording nothing to be said or thought. Mr. Knightley and Harriet Smith? Such an elevation on her side, such a debasement on his. It was horrible to Emma to think how it must sink him in the general opinion to foresee the smiles, the sneers, the merriment it would prompt at his expense, the mortification and disdain of his brother, the thousand inconveniences to himself. Could it be? No, it was impossible. And yet it was far, very far from impossible. Was it a new circumstance for a man of first-rate abilities to be captivated by very inferior powers? Was it new for one, perhaps too busy to seek, to be the prize of a girl who would seek him? Was it new for anything in this world to be unequal, inconsistent, incongruous, or for chance and circumstance, as second causes, to direct the human fate? Oh, had she never brought Harriet forward? Had she left her where she ought and where he had told her she ought? Had she not, with a folly which no tongue could express, prevented her marrying the unexceptionable young man who would have made her happy and respectable in the line of life to which she ought to belong, all would have been safe. None of this dreadful sequel would have, would have been. How Harriet could ever have had the presumption to raise her thoughts to Mr. Knightley? How she could dare to fancy herself the chosen of such a man till actually assured of it? But Harriet was less humble had fewer scruples than formerly. Her inferiority, whether of mind or situation, seemed little felt. She had seemed more sensible of Mr. Elton's being to stoop in marrying her than she now seemed of Mr. Knightley's. Alas, was not that her own doing too? Who had been at pains to give Harriet notions of self-consequence but herself? Who but herself had taught her that she was to elevate herself if possible and that her claims were great to a high worldly establishment? If Harriet, from being humble, were grown vain, it was her doing too. And now chapter 12 of volume 3 or chapter 48 of Emma. Till now that she was threatened with its loss, Emma had never known how much of her happiness depended on being first with Mr. Knightley, first in interest and affection. Satisfied that it was so and feeling it her due, she had enjoyed it without reflection and only in the dread of being supplanted found how inexpressibly important it had been. Long, very long, she felt she had been first. For having no female connections of his own, there had been only Isabella, whose claims could not be compared with hers, and she had always known exactly how far he loved and esteemed Isabella. She had herself been first with him for many years past. She had not deserved it. She had often been negligent or perverse, slighting his advice or even willfully opposing him, insensible of half his merits and quarreling him, quarreling with him because he would not acknowledge her false and insolent estimate of her own. But still, from family attachment and habit and thorough excellence of mind, he had loved her and watched over her from a girl with an endeavor to improve her and an anxiety for her doing right which no other creature had at all shared. In spite of all her faults, she knew she was dear to him. Might she not say very dear? When the suggestions of hope, however, which might follow here presented themselves, she could not presume to indulge them. 
Harriet Smith might think herself not unworthy of being peculiarly, exclusively, passionately loved by Mr. Knightley. She could not. She could not flatter herself with any idea of blindness in his attachment to her. She had received a very recent proof of its impartiality. How shocked had he been by her behavior to Miss Bates? How directly, how strongly had he expressed himself to her on the subject? Not too strongly for the offense, but far, far too strongly to issue from any feeling softer than upright justice and clear-sighted goodwill. She had no hope nothing to deserve the name of hope that he could have some sort of affection for herself, which was now in question. But there was a hope, at times a slight one, at times much stronger, that Harriet might have deceived herself and be overrating his regard for her. Wish it she must, for his sake, be the consequence nothing to herself, but his remaining single all his life. Could she be secure of that, indeed, of his never marrying at all, she believed she should be perfectly satisfied. Let him but continue the same Mr. Knightley to her and her father, the same Mr. Knightley to all the world. Let Donwell and Hartfield lose none of their precious intercourse of friendship and confidence, and her peace would be fully secured. Marriage, in fact, would not do for her. It would be incompatible with what she owed to her father and with what she felt for him. Nothing should separate her from her father. She would not marry even if she were asked by Mr. Knightley. It must be her ardent wish that Harriet might be disappointed, and she hoped that when able to see them together again, she might at least be able to ascertain what the chances for it were. She should see them henceforward with the closest observance, and wretchedly, as she had hitherto misunderstood even those she was watching, she did not know how to admit that she could be blinded here. He was expected back every day the power of observation would be soon given. Frightfully soon, it appeared when her thoughts were in one course. In the meanwhile, she resolved against seeing Harriet. It would do neither of them good. It would do the subject no good to be talking of it further. She was resolved not to be convinced as long as she could doubt, and yet had no authority for opposing Harriet's confidence. To talk would be only to irritate. She wrote to her, therefore, kindly but decisively, to beg that she would not, at present, come to Hartfield acknowledging it to be her conviction that all farther confidential discussion of one topic had better be avoided, and hoping that if a few days were allowed to pass before they met again, except in the company of others, she objected only to a tete-a-tete, -tete, they might be able to act as if they had forgotten the conversation of yesterday. Harriet submitted and approved and was grateful. This point was just arranged when a visitor arrived to tear Emma's thoughts a little from the one subject which had engrossed them, sleeping or waking, the last 24 hours. Mrs. Weston, who had been calling on her daughter-in-law elect and took Hartfield in her way home, almost as much in duty to Emma as in pleasure to herself, to relate all the particulars of so interesting an interview. Mr. Weston had accompanied her to Mrs. Bates's and gone through his share of this essential attention most handsomely. But she, having then induced Miss Fairfax to join her in an airing, was now returned with much more to say, and much more to say with satisfaction that a quarter of an hour spent in Mrs. Bates's parlor, with all the encumbrance of awkward feelings, could have afforded. A little curiosity Emma had, and she made the most of it while her friend related. Mrs. Weston had set off to pay the visit in a good deal of agitation herself, and in the first place had wished to go, had wished not to go at all at present, to be allowed merely to write to Miss Fairfax instead, and to defer the ceremonious call till a little time had passed, and Mr. Churchill should be reconciled to the engagements becoming known, as, considering everything, she thought such a visit could not be paid without leading to reports. But Mr. Weston had thought differently. He was extremely anxious to show his approbation to Miss Fairfax and her family, and did not conceive that any suspicion could be excited by it or if it were, that it would be of any consequence, for such things, he observed, always got about. Emma smiled and felt that Mr. Weston had very good reason for saying so. They had gone, in short, and very great had been the evident distress and confusion of the lady. She had hardly been able to say a word, and every look and action had shown how deeply she was suffering from consciousness. The quiet, heartfelt satisfaction of the old lady and the rapturous delight of her daughter, who proved even too joyous to talk as usual, had been a gratifying, yet almost an affecting scene. They were both so truly respectable in their happiness, 
so disinterested in every sensation, thought so much of Jane, so much of everybody, and so little of themselves that every kindly feeling was at work for them. Miss Fairfax's recent illness had offered a fair plea for Mrs. Weston to, to invite her for an airing. She was drawn back and declined at first, but on being pressed had yielded, and in the course of their drive, Mrs. Weston had, by gentle encouragement, overcome so much of her embarrassment as to bring her to converse on the important subject. Apologies for her seemingly ungracious silence in their first reception, and the warmest expressions of the gratitude she was always feeling towards herself and Mr. Weston must necessarily open the cause. But when these effusions were put by, they had talked a, great, a good deal of the present and of the future state of the engagement. Mrs. Weston was convinced that such conversation must be the greatest relief to her companion, pent up within her own mind as everything had so long been, and was very much pleased with all that she had said on the subject. Oh, the misery, on the misery of what she had suffered during the concealment of so many months, continued Mrs. Weston, she was energetic. This was one of her expressions. I will not say that since I entered into the engagement, I have not had some happy moments, but I can say that I have never known the blessing of one tranquil hour. And the quivering lip, Emma, which uttered it, was an, was an attestation that I felt at my heart. Poor girl, said Emma. She thinks herself wrong then for having consented to a private engagement. Wrong? No one, I believe, can blame her more than she is disposed to blame herself. The consequence, said she, has been a state of perpetual suffering to me, and so it ought. But after all the punishment that misconduct can bring, it is still not less misconduct. Pain is no expiation. I never can be blameless. I have been acting contrary to all my sense of right and the fortunate turn that everything has taken, and the kindness I am now receiving is what my conscience tells me ought not to be. Do not imagine, madam, she continued, that I was taught wrong. Do not let any reflection fall on the principles or the care of the friends who brought me up. The error has been all my own, and I do assure you that with all the excuse that present circumstances may appear to give, I shall yet dread making the story known to Colonel Campbell. Poor girl, said Emma again. She loves him then excessively, I suppose. It must have been from attachment only that she could be led to form the engagement. Her affection must have overpowered her judgment. Yes, I have no doubt of her being extremely attached to him. <sighs> I am afraid, returned Emma, sighing, that I must have often, excuse me, that I must often have contributed to make her unhappy. On your side, my love, it was very innocently done but she probably had something of that in her thoughts when alluding to the misunderstandings which he had given us hints of before. One natural consequence of the evil she had involved herself in, she said, was that of making her unreasonable. The consciousness of having done amiss had exposed her to a thousand inquietudes and made her captious and irritable to a degree that must have been, that had been hard for him to bear. I did not make the allowances, said she, which I ought to have done for his temper and spirits his delightful spirits, and that gaiety, that playfulness of disposition, which under any other circumstances would, I am sure, have been as constantly bewitching to me as they were at first. She then began to speak of you, and of the great kindness you had shown her during her illness, and with a blush which showed me how it was all connected, desired me, whenever I had an opportunity, to thank you. I could not thank you too much for every wish and every endeavor to do her good. She was sensible that you had never received any proper acknowledgement from herself. If I did not know her to be happy now, said Emma seriously, which, in spite of every little drawback from her scrupulous conscience she must be, I could not bear these thanks. For, oh, Mrs. Weston, if there were an account drawn up of the evil and the good I have done, Miss Fairfax, well, checking herself and trying to be more lively, this is all to be forgotten. You are very kind to bring me these interesting particulars. They show her to the greatest advantage. I am sure she is very good. I hope she will be very happy. It is fit that the fortune should be on his side, for I think the merit will be all on hers. Such a conclusion could not pass unanswered by Mrs. Weston. She thought well of Frank in almost every respect, and what was more, she loved him very much, and her defense was therefore earnest. She talked with a great deal of reason and at least equal affection, but she had too much to urge for Emma's attention. 
It was soon gone to Brunswick Square or to Donwell. She forgot to attempt to listen. And when Mrs. Weston ended with, we have not yet had the letter we are so anxious for, you know, but I hope it will soon come. She was obliged to pause before she answered, and at last, obliged to answer at random, before she could at all recollect what letter it was which they were so anxious for. Are you well, my Emma? was Mrs. Weston's parting question. Oh, perfectly. I am always well, you know. Be sure to give my be sure to give me intelligence of the letter as soon as possible. Mrs. Weston's communications furnished Emma with more food for unpleasant reflection by increasing her esteem and compassion and her sense of past injustice towards Miss Fairfax. She bitterly regretted not having sought a closer acquaintance with her and blushed for the envious feelings which had certainly been, in some measure, the cause. Had she followed Mr. Knightley's known wishes in paying that attention to Miss Fairfax, which was every way her due, had she tried to know her better, had she done her part towards intimacy, had she endeavored to find a friend there instead of in Harriet Smith, she must, in all probability, have been spared from every pain which pressed on her now. Birth, abilities, and education had been equally marking one as an associate with her, for her, to be received with gratitude. And the other? What was she? Supposing even that they had never become intimate friends, that she had never been admitted into Miss Fairfax's confidence on this important matter, which was most probable. Still, in knowing her as she ought, and as she might, she must have been preserved from the abominable suspicions of an improper attachment to Mr. Dixon, which she had not only so foolishly fashioned and harbored herself, but had so unpardonably imparted, an idea which she greatly feared had been made a subject of material distress to the delicacy of Jane's feelings by the levity or carelessness of Frank Churchill's. Of all the sources of evil surrounding the former since her coming to Highbury, she was persuaded that she must herself have been the worst. She must have been a perpetual enemy. They never could have been all three together without her having stabbed Jane Fairfax's peace in a thousand instances. And on Box Hill, perhaps, it had been the agony of a mind that would bear no more. The evening of this day was very long and melancholy at Hartfield. The weather added what it could of gloom. A cold, stormy rain set in, and nothing of July appeared but in the trees and shrubs, which the wind was despoiling, and the length of the day which only made such cruel sights the longer visible. The weather affected Mr. Woodhouse, and he could only be kept tolerably comfortable by almost ceaseless attention on his daughter's side, and by exertions which had never cost her half so much before. It reminded her of their first forlorn tete-a-tete -tete on the evening of Mrs. Weston's wedding day. But Mr. Knightley had walked in then, soon after tea, and dissipated every melancholy fancy. Alas, such delightful proofs of Hartfield's attraction as those sorts of visits conveyed might shortly be over. The picture which she had then drawn of the privations of the approaching winter had proved erroneous. No friends had deserted them, no pleasures had been lost, but her present forebodings she feared would experience no similar contradiction. The prospect before her now was threatening to a degree that could not be entirely dispelled, that might not be even partially brightened. It all took place that might take place among, excuse me, if all took place that might take place among the circle of her friends, Hartfield must be comparatively deserted, and she left to cheer her father with the spirits only of ruined happiness. The child to be born at Randall's must be a tie there even deeper than herself and Mrs. Weston's heart and time would be occupied by it. They should lose her, and probably in great measure, her husband also. Frank Churchill would return among them no more, and Miss Fairfax, it was reasonable to suppose, would soon cease to belong to Highbury. They would be married and settled either at or near Enscombe. All that were good would be withdrawn, and if to these losses the loss of Donwell were to be added, what would remain of cheerful or of rational society within their reach? Mr. Knightley to be no longer coming there for his evening comfort, no longer walking in at all hours, as if ever willing to change his own home for theirs. How was it to be endured? And if he were to be lost to them for Harriet's sake, if he were to be thought of hereafter as, as finding in Harriet's society all that he wanted, if Harriet were to be the chosen, the first, the dearest, the friend, the wife to whom he looked for all the best blessings of existence, what could be increasing Emma's wretchedness but the reflection never far distant from her mind that it had been all her own work? 
When it came to such a pitch as this, she was not able to refrain from a start or a heavy sigh, or even from walking about the room for a few seconds. And the only source whence anything like consolation or composure could be drawn was in the resolution of her own better conduct and the hope that however inferior in spirit and gaiety might be the following and every future winter of her life to the past, it would yet find her more rational, more acquainted with herself and leave her less to regret when it were gone. So a kind of sobering end to the chapter. Um, we will see what happens tomorrow. We will see what happens tomorrow. So again, one last chance to go in and vote on what you would like to read next. Tomorrow, um, we'll start out by announcing our next read and then we'll go in and read. Um, tomorrow is two more chapters. It's really good stuff. I, I did peek ahead. It's good stuff tomorrow. So I'll see you then. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care, friends. Bye.